Right, well, thank you. We have a, a smaller group tonight, but we may have some people join us um, a little bit later. So Meredith is our speaker for this evening. Um, obviously, she's been talking a little bit about some of the stuff she's done, but she's um, more involved now in um, mentoring people with creativity and also facilitating sessions. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Meredith. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you to KMLF for uh, inviting me back. It's always a pleasure to join you guys. And, and thank you, especially Sharon, for um, helping to organise tonight. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge I, I'm on the, um, I'm in Coburg North up here in Melbourne. So I'm on the country of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. So I'd like to acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging uh, and pay my respects to them. Um, I guess what I'm gonna do tonight is tell you a story, um, tell you a story about why I named this session Creating in Fragments, what the hell it's got to do with Substack um, and just give you some background. I, I guess this is a story about what I've been doing over the last couple of years up till now. Um, it's uh, something, an adventure I've been very much enjoying, but uh, something I consider a, a work in progress and an experiment. So I'll give you my background story and that'll take about 20 minutes. And then afterwards we can bust it open for um, conversation. And you're welcome to ask any questions you, you have. I've got a few questions for you that you're welcome to ignore or respond to, but I, I'm, I'd be genuinely interested in your insight. Um, so what I, I'll do at first is, is try and set the scene with a, just a couple of quick provocations. And um, maybe you can respond to this first one by jotting down a few words in Zoom in the Zoom chat if, um, if you're so moved to. But here's a question for you to chew on. Um, what's the difference between you and your great, great, great grandparents? So what's the difference between someone born in our generation and the generation of our great, great, great grandparents? So just take a minute to think of that. And I'll come back to it in, um, in a few minutes in the session. I'm alive, yes, <laughs> thank you. No horror movie um, scenarios here. More global, less well-connected. Uh, life expectancy as a woman, more opportunities. And as, as Sharon said, what I um, have been working on over the last couple of years is something I've actually been chipping away at pre-pandemic, pre-2020, for years before that. Um, I have an interest in creativity. I used to work in the arts industry and then moved into the community sector and the university sectors. But I'm fascinated by creativity and the way people relate to their sense of being creative, their sense of creative identity and how people build uh, confidence in having a creative mindset and being able to develop creative process as well. Um, so very interested in that. I've been working as a mentor, so one-on-one, -on -one, but also facilitating little workshops and uh, facilitated discussions as well. But into that mix of services, I've added other things and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. In some of these workshops, I use provocation like this. Um, and as you can see from the Zoom chat, it elicits fantastic responses, really great responses, um, which is great. So we'll return to that, but thank you for that. Here's another provocation for you, and I'm gonna start setting the scene now for my background story. Um, uh, in November, 2021 in The Guardian, um, the poet and author Ben Okri wrote an article and in it he, he provoked people to write as if these were the last days. 
and he was really um, responding to the threat of climate change. But it was interesting, I read that while I was in or just coming out of lockdown, I've lost track, I'm sure we all have. And I read that just before I started my experiment with Substack, which I'll talk about later. But it, it really, that quote reminds me of the state of mind I was in during lockdown, during that odd time. So cast your minds back, especially to March and April 2020, when we were first going into lockdown, when we were starting that huge adventure, we didn't know what was ahead of us. It all felt really weird, for some people really hard. Um, for me, it was like looking ahead into the future uh, but during the pandemic, suddenly I felt like I, I was looking down a path, but I could only see a few feet ahead and then the rest of the path was obscured by fog. So I knew there was a landscape to walk across. I knew there was even a path across that landscape, but I couldn't see it because of the fog. So for me, lockdown was being thrust into a liminal space, not quite the end of days or last days or anything like that. But I felt very strongly in myself that something had ended and um, something else would be emerging, but not for a while, and that we were in this liminal space, which was quite an odd space to be in. Um, for me, not wholly bad. It was challenging. I live by myself. So my challenge, my daily challenge through days of lockdown was not to go nuts from isolation. But I also had an advantage in that I lost all my work. I've been doing training and facilitation work in 2020. I lost that. But uh, as a sole trader, I got job keeper. Um, is it job keeper? Yeah, job keeper, for which I was very grateful. But my time was subsidized. And that meant I was able to put time into working on developing my practice in creative mentoring and creative facilitation, which was something I'd only ever been able to do part time around the edges of day jobs. So for me, that was quite transformative. Um, so for me, lockdown was really a catalyst because it allowed me that space of focus. Being alone, my main connection to the world was digital. So it was via Zoom and via Twitter. On Twitter, I was encountering a lot of people who like me felt this was an interesting time, an opportunity to reflect on disruptions reflect on what had seemed to cease and what was not yet to come. Um, I was able to connect with um, networks of people, ecosystems, communities of practice, organisations that prior to the pandemic, I never knew existed, um, which was fantastic. Organisations that had only previously ever met face to face suddenly gone onto Twitter and said, hey, we're having our conference online. Anyone in the world who's awake when it happens is allowed to join in, and I did. What that did was connect me to bodies of knowledge that I hadn't known existed. So I've been carrying out my own experiments on um, creative facilitation. But then suddenly I met other people who were doing similar stuff. And these were people who'd been working on their stuff in communities of practice that I hadn't had access to. So to help me frame and understand what I, what I was doing, I suddenly was accessing um, bodies of knowledge, frameworks, concepts. Um, people had written blogs, articles, were sharing reports, um, holding meetup groups, hosting uh, uh, workshops and masterclasses. So for me, as a creative worker and a knowledge worker, I was able to connect into all this knowledge, which was fantastic, um, build networks. And the connections I was making, I was doing digitally via social media, bloody Twitter, dreadful Twitter was a gold. It was fantastic. Um, it yielded all this great stuff. And Twitter, Zoom, of course, I was signing up for newsletters, all that kind of stuff, people's blogs. Um, so this brings me back to that, that provocation of what's the difference between you and your great-great-great-grandfather? What makes you different? 
I included that quote in this presentation because of the answer. That, that provocation, by the way, came from a guy called David Mitchell, who's an author, and that's a provocation he gives to his writing students. And his answer is, the difference is what you take for granted. So we here now can take different things for granted than our, our great, great, great grandparents. What lockdown did for me was make me question what I took for granted, what I was assuming the way I had to work prior to lockdown. And it made me shift my thinking into new ways of working and new information and knowledge to work with, which was a gift. It was an incredible gift. So it made me uh, reconsider sourcing, how I sourced, adapted, developed, curated, shared and created my own original material, which was digitally. It made me discover new tools like Zoom. I hated Zoom before the pandemic, but I had to learn to use it. Now I like and I've been enjoying finding out what I can do with it. It helped me discover things like Substack, something I probably would never have even attempted before the pandemic. Um, it made me do things like write my little pamphlets and turn them into ebooks that I could sell on my website. And it reinvigorated my use of blogging and email and social media as well. People were engaging with me, which was delightful. So who were those people? This was interesting. Here's another provocation for you. It's from the poet Mary Oliver, and it's listen. Are you breathing just a little and calling it a life? Which I think is lovely. So I'm going to put that in the Zoom chat for you. And for me, that's a really relevant little quote that's haunted me over the last year because of who was seeking me out and engaging me via Twitter sometimes booking into my um, workshops or in for mentoring appointments on Zoom, um, and then also finally subscribing to the Substack. I want you to imagine uh, a morning commute from the suburbs into the CBD. And in your imagination, be it on a bus, a tram or a train carriage, zero in on a typical worker sitting in their seat if they've been able to grab one. It's not too crowded. Um, they're going in for their nine to five job, maybe five days a week. But you know, looking at them, they look a bit half asleep, that maybe they've been bookended, uh, that job has been bookended by other stuff. Maybe they're parenting. They might be caring for a disabled person, part-time caring for an elderly parent. They may be volunteering for stuff. They may be... Um, otherwise obligated or connected to family and friends in other ways. That morning, the dog threw up on the carpet. They're sitting on the tram asking themselves how they're going to find the time to get their mum to her dietrist's appointment. And they're thinking they really should go and help their sister move house in the weekend, but they don't feel like it. So think of that person, because that's who I've been talking to over the last couple of years. The other people I've been talking and overlapping with that person are overwhelmingly knowledge workers, which I guess is not surprising because that's my interest and that's what I'm putting out there on social media. But the people who've been connecting with what I do are overwhelmingly knowledge workers, um, by which I mean they're people like uh, academics, um, creative workers like designers or arts managers, project managers, trainers and facilitators, um, consultants. Uh, they're people who work in areas like learning and development, human resources, community development, community engagement. Uh, they come from sectors um, such as the arts sector or the creative sector as well, uh, the university sector, community sector, public health, and the odd blowing from the corporate sector. And these people deeply value creativity. They understand it and they understand its, its value. They want to be more creative. They feel the need to apply creativity to their work, um, but they also want it to enrich their life outside of work. 
some of them aspire to write a novel or get back to painting or join a choir or something like that. Some of them don't have very um, well-defined goals, but they have a yearning. They feel empty inside. They have a yearning to connect with that creative part of themselves. The challenge these people face is that they're busy and they're tired and their attention is split across lots of different areas. And um, so the, the challenge is when do they find the time to connect with being creative? When do they find the time to even pursue that? And how do they do it? One uh, mentee of mine said to me, I don't even know how to get started. And um, tellingly, that woman then has repeatedly not been able to get to appointments. She wants to keep with me because she's so busy. And that's a pattern I keep seeing. Um, people who book into workshops and can't come because they're too busy. They email me afterwards and apologise. I get it. So that's their challenge. They have a yearning, but their, their attention is being pulled and split all the time. My challenge is how do I work with these people? I feel incredibly compelled by this. I'm so interested in how um, busyness and fatigue affects people's sense of creative identity, how it can stick a wedge between a person and their sense of creative identity. I feel incredibly compelled. I feel a lot of compassion for people around that. It's a challenge. Too. So how do I reach them? How do I help them? So I'm going to give you another little prompt. And this is also from the poet Mary Oliver. And this comes in the form of um, some instructions. Instructions for living a life. Pay attention. Be astonished. Tell about it. I think that's a really cool um, a cool way of starting in on creative process. And uh, I'll stick that in the Zoom chat as well. By the way, I've uh, written all these up in a blog and I'll stick the blog up uh, on the KMLF page tomorrow, a link to it so you can get at it. So my job is to help people pay attention when their concentration is split to find that moment of astonishment or wonder or curiosity or um, even outrage if it gets their juices flowing, um, certainly inspiration, and to make them believe that if not now, someday they could tell about it or blog about it or draw it or act it or sculpt it or sew it or cook it, whatever they like to do. But how to do this when they don't have time for an hour-long um, mentor um, appointment. Here we come to Substack. Last year I, I was thinking about how to do this and whether I should be um, experimenting with some kind of newsletter which I'd never done before um, and what I had from my own adventures on Twitter and in Zoom and reading people's blogs and newsletters and reading books and writing stuff myself as well was a laptop jammed with little thought exercises, prompts, provocations, reflections, quotes, images, tons of stuff. And I was inspired by other people who on Twitter and in their newsletters were saying, I'm doing an advent calendar every day between the 1st of December and um, Christmas Eve, I'll send out a prompt as, as a daily advent calendar a daily inspiration. And I thought, I'll do that with all this stuff that I love that I don't know what to do with. So I put the call out um, on Twitter and LinkedIn, started my sub stack. I thought maybe four people would sign up at 200 feet almost immediately. And they've been still signing up in a trickle ever since. And I was, every day I'd send out a short, sharp prompt of provocation. So all of the quotes I've shared with you so far have been the basis of some of those prompts or provocation. Um, earlier, Stuart was looking through the substacks and he, he found one about uh, colour, using colour to reflect on yourself, for example. Um, I got terrific feedback from that. 
and it was doing exactly what I wanted, giving people something short and sharp to read, easily digestible, um, but not superficial. I didn't want some fuzzy feel-good quote with a, a rainbow and a unicorn attached, none of that, no cat memes. I want some, uh, to give people something they can chew on through the day. So our tired person on the tram could flick open one of my email prompts, read it, think, huh, and then think about it during the day. And what I hope that would do for them was give them an opportunity to get back in touch, even briefly, with that creative um, person inside them, that that part of themselves that gets orphaned and split off from the other parts of their lives. Um, my final quote uh, that was also a basis for a, a Substack prompt was, um, oh, here it is, a, a quote from an author called Juno Diaz. And she talks about what a monumental work of art does. She says, it takes the pieces of you, reassembles them and hands them back to you all in the right order. Now, my substacks are not a monumental work of art, so they don't do that. <laughs> but I love that phrase, takes the pieces of you, because I feel like I'm talking or, or dealing with people who are in pieces. Their attention, their sense of an inner life is in pieces. And what I'm hoping to do with the substack is reach out to them in their busyness and talk to that piece of them that is creative. And, um, and just give them even a few minutes of sense of reintegrating that piece with the rest of them. Um, so I, I think uh, I'm nearly finished. What else do I wanna say? Oh yeah, creating in fragments. That's a phrase I invented a few years ago uh, because in my life I've switched between being um, a creative worker who was working full time, so immersed in creativity all day, every day, no money. So I would have to switch at stages to doing a day job so I could um, pay the rent and dig myself out of financial trouble. But that meant I had no time or energy for creative work and creative work was pushed into the margins of my life, just like it is for these knowledge workers. But I discovered, um, I discovered that when I was doing the nine to five job, that I could do what I call creating in fragments. So grab half an hour here, 15 minutes there, a couple of hours on the weekend. I didn't make great art, um, but what I did do was keep in touch with the sense of potential of, of being a creative person and reinvigorating a creative practice. I always could do. So that's what I'm trying to give to people. So that's my, my background story of how I've come to use Substack. Um, I'm going to hand it over to you now and you can ask or say whatever you like. I do have a few questions for you to chew on. Did I write them down? Um, here we are. No, I didn't write them down. But anyway, here are my questions. Question one was during lockdown, for me it was a catalyst and it changed the way I accessed and, and used knowledge. Did it do the same for you? Um, question two was, oh, in your work, do you find yourself, do you get a sense that you're working with people who are also very challenged by busyness and exhaustion and that affects their um, sense of concentration, their ability to pay attention, their ability to learn and to create. And question three was, if you are in that situation with people who are challenged by fatigue um, and busyness, the two go together, let's face it, how do you help them? Do you have any sense of how? Like I said, ignore those questions or, and ask your own if you like. So over to you. Um, it's Simon here. I'm, Hi, I Simon. I, I came with about 50 questions. I've probably got about 150 now, but I don't want to, I don't want to take it over, but just a quick response to your questions. Um, uh, yes, uh, the lockdown enabled me to, I guess, tap into the creative bent and also technology. So, um, I was, uh, one of the 
facilitators of the last KMLF session where I talked about using Mural, uh, the online collaborative whiteboard, which has been fantastic um, for me in my profession, which I, I do executive coaching and online facilitation. So that enabled me. Um, and the other questions part of my job as executive coach, uh, absolutely. Um, I encounter people that are always challenged and stressed and they're exactly like the person that you said we should envisage on the on the tram in the morning. I, I deal with that all the time. So, and getting them to tap into their creativity is always a challenge. So, but I guess my underlying big question back to you is, I, I don't get a, quite a sense of what Substack is mm -hmm. and and how that is enabling you to do what you do. And and the cynic in me is that my little investigation of it is it's just another example of the subscription based model where somebody's designed a neat tool that looks beautiful. It's got all the user experience, all that sort of stuff. You can go and play and read. So I was able to read your Substack for free, but the whole intention is to get subscriptions and you'd get some payment. Great. But the developers would get some sort of payment. So that's the cynic in me. That's another example of that. Um, and I don't quite get a full appreciation of how Substack enables or empowers your creative process. Um, thank you. Uh, and thank you for sharing um, uh, a response to my earlier questions. Um, so, and your cynic is right in, in describing what Substack is and how it works. It is a platform. Um, it's geared towards uh, helping people easily construct newsletters and send them out. You're quite right. It is a subscriber um, model. So you can, uh, for example, uh, my advent calendar last year was free subscription, so I didn't charge. And I send out a, a monthly newsletter now, which is also free. And I have a small bunch of paid subscribers who get an extra two um, newsletters per month. Um, some writers do use it and do want to just um, drive paid subscriptions as an income stream. While I'm happy if I get a few payments um, because it defrays, you know, a few overheads, my main gain from a, a business perspective is not to make money out of Substack. What I like about it in a very uh, technical sense is it's easy to use. It's a clean, as he said, a clean, good-looking platform. You chuck in some text and a picture, send it out. It's easier to wrangle people. So on a practical sense, um, it's exactly how you described it. For me, the creative thing, I think it's how I've chosen to use it because it is easy to quickly build um, a, a newsletter or a little prompt. What I can do is um, and just keep a, a consistent kind of rollout of these little creative prompts. Um, what people who subscribe to the Advent Calendar um, said back to me was that they really enjoyed the variety of stuff I was sending them, um, that it was easy to read, it was easy for them to come at, that it really made them think and imagine, uh, which was great. That, that was my, my goal, digestible but deeply creative. So Substack is what your inner cynic thinks it is as a practical tool, and I think it's then just how you use it. Me, it's really enabled me, I guess with everything else that I do, um, there's a mixture of stuff I'm doing and the creative mentoring, I just love doing. I have no idea how much I love doing it, but it's intense. Those hour long conversations are intense. Uh, the workshops I, I offer, I love doing as well, you know, and I really want to grow that. But as anybody here knows, developing and presenting a workshop promoting it, all that kind of stuff is also intense. So, um, oh, and I, I write. So I'm writing my little booklets. I'm, I'm writing blogs. I'm working on stuff right now. I also love that to death. And I can use that to go in much more deeper and, and much more nuanced um, in, in my explanations of things. It's also intense. 
So for me, and it was a good question actually, Simon, now I'm coming to answer it, how it's enabled me creatively, Substack, is that it's so damn easy to use that I can just quickly take all this stuff I've accrued, um, chuck it in, send it out quickly. Thank you. Yep. I have other questions, but I'm, I'm keen for others to contribute as well. So, Anyone else? I'll ask a question, Meredith. Um, so when people subscribe to Subs uh, um, Substack, do they subscribe to Meredith Lewis or do they subscribe to Substack and then they get access to a whole range of other people? It's, uh, they, they subscribe to Meredith Lewis Substack. Um, right. So it's like, it's like a blog. Think of it like a blog. You know how you start a blog and it might be on WordPress, say, but it's your blog if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so it's the same with Substack. If they um, subscribe to Methods of Madness, they've subscribed to Methods of Madness. I think it's a, a, they have to create an account on Substack and then to get to Methods of Madness, and then it's easier for them to subscribe to other stuff. But it's, it's not really Substack capturing their um, email addresses. So my subscribers, that big long list, that is mine. That belongs mm. to me, all those email addresses. It doesn't belong to Substack. And I think that's really important. Mm. So how do people find you specifically? You know, you know, like with something like Spotify, you subscribe to Spotify and then you go digging around and see what's there and mm. maybe you find new artists or people that you didn't know about. If I, how would I find, you know, Meredith Lewis if I didn't know that she already existed? Um, it, it'd be hard if you were going through Substack. Mm. But Substack can work like Spotify. And once people go on the site below one newsletter, they can go and search. And some writers do use it like that. Um, I really treat Substack almost as a community, I gather. But I don't. I, I actually, uh, people find me via social media, so Twitter and LinkedIn. Mainly Twitter, actually, surprised me. I thought maybe four people had signed up last year. And, um, yeah, it was a, a big surprise. But people initially found me via Twitter and LinkedIn. Now a few coming from my, my website. Um, what has been very interesting for me and very useful, actually, was learning over the last year of how to make Substack, Twitter, LinkedIn, my new website, all talk talk to each other, refer to each other. And I guess I'm trying to set them up like um, some kind of basic sales funnel. And yeah, so that they're sort of evidently sort of self-referential and they're working together to um, bring people to and from me. And, and once they subscribe to you, um, is it very uh, uh, conversational, like you and your subscribers are interacting with each other and, and other people can see what your other subscribers are saying and, and chip into the same conversation? It could be. It's not, interestingly. I find that really interesting. Um, Substack allows for comments, certainly, and other Substack newsletters I follow have that going on. People don't leave comments on my Substack, and I thought they would. What they do is they send me direct messages in Twitter, uh, sometimes emails as well, and give me private feedback about what's happening on Substack. And I found that absolutely fascinating. I, I really thought people would be replying in comments and saying, hey, great exercise. I thought this, that, and the other. But instead they're telling me in these rather more private sort of settings, which I don't know what that's about, but it makes me ponder that they want a, a, an intimate or a private connection. Not that they're saying anything that you'd be embarrassed to see in mm. public, but, yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not leaving comments, but they are sending messages. Yeah, I've always found that um, the conversations are far more interesting, you know, if, if they're kind of shared because, you know, sort of, 
you know, Simon says something to Meredith, Meredith answers, then Margaret says, oh, but hang on, you know, what about this? And then, you know, Stuart would say, well, actually, I kind of agree with Margaret. You know, it, it, it's, it's when you, to me at least, you know, when you have those really diverse conversations with lots of perspectives coming in, you know, mm -hmm. that, that make it interesting. Sometimes, sometimes you see that on LinkedIn, uh, not mm -hmm. all that often, but, um, and it, Twitter maybe eight years ago used to be more like that, but Pitt, Twitter is now more sort of, you know, sort of put, just putting stuff out there and not a lot of interaction as much. Uh, some accounts, yes, most no. Uh, but anyway, that's, that's, that's my experience. So yeah. I'm just interested. It is interesting, and I agree with you. You know, I, I'd love it if we could create more dialogue. And I, I agree. I, I find, um, I said to someone earlier, maybe it was Stuart, that with the prompts I put out both on Substack and when I get my little messages back from people, and also in my, my workshops when I put out similar prompts, I love and I'm fascinated, endlessly fascinated by how diverse people's responses are, equally rich and imaginative but incredibly diverse, um, which just says something about human creativity and it's fun in, in the events and workshops when people do that. Um, so I agree, and I agree with your comments about social media. I think LinkedIn's hopeless, that, and Twitter used to be great, and Twitter's, that bloody Twitter algorithm, I think, is killing Twitter. I have very mixed feelings about Twitter. I love it and I hate it, but, um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Stuart, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I love the the open nature of your questions. I, I um, uh, some of us here know Frank Connolly, who does a similar thing online with his Think Quick posts, and they're they're a similar open nature, more of a riddle type thing. I mm -hmm. I find it interesting. I'm trying not to. I'm trying to avoid the stereotypes of male versus female with him going down a very intellectual route and you taking a very um, uh, emotive and impersonal route to your questions. That I love your questions. They really, they really challenge me. Um, you asked the question there, was lockdown a catalyst for you? Why and why not? And um, I did do a bit of art work over, over, over COVID, but a lot less than I normally do. Mm -hmm. um, I had a bit of burnout through lockdown and just the sheer volume of work we did was probably half again, as much as we'd normally do if we we're in the office. And um, I took three months, I took three weeks off um, in the UK in June. And in that time did more drawing, sketching, painting in those couple of weeks than I had in the entire 12 months previously. And uh, some of you may know, I do a lot of little business card sketches, just little sketchy things. And, but they, they're good enough for me and they fit in with my life. But I was inspired while I was over there to get a bit bigger, to do something a bit more challenging. And when I came back, I, I finished a sketch of the um, cathedral in Bath, Bath Abbey, mm -hmm. um, which I was really happy with. So I thought, I'm going to go bigger again. I'm going to go A4. I'm going to try and do an A4. And so I found a picture of this amazing clock in Rouen in France. And I'd seen somebody else's sketch. So I had some inspiration there of how I might translate that into a sketch. And then I, I went and bought myself an A4 sketching book. And I opened it up to a nice blank page. And I put four pencil lines on it and then sat there at the table with a movie on for five and a half hours mm. before I started drawing. It took me that long to get brave enough to do it. And I find myself wondering, is the reason I don't do more art and I'm not more creative with work and with COVID and with everything else because I've never given myself five and a half hours to sit there and get my head around expressing what I wanted to express. Mm. Um, I don't think it's a lack of skill that stopped me starting. That's the final picture, by the way, uh, of that amazing clock. So I can, I can obviously draw, 
what was what stopped me for five and a half hours and and how can i give myself not five and a half hours but maybe that time i need just to build up my bravery to be creative in the future that's kind of the the thoughts that are rumbling around in my head after your nice challenges yeah. it's really um thank you for sharing that it's it's that's what fascinates me that's where i talk about the relationship people have to that creative self and it's not always about churning out heaps of work or how skilled am I. It's it's about the other stuff, that, that, that five and a half hours. Um, it's interesting to me when I talk to people about creativity, how often I have to say, uh, don't, don't worry if, if you feel burnout and exhausted, rest. The best thing you can do for yourself creatively is have times of rest. Don't, don't sweat it. Um, uh, of course, we have to talk to people about um, uh, don't don't care if you make bad bad art. I mean, who gets to make that call anyway? Uh, don't don't um, don't worry about don't set yourself mad goals in terms of output or whatever. Sometimes that can be helpful to make a goal that I will write a thousand words, you know, today, and sometimes not at all helpful. So. Um, making that relationship with your creative self is getting a sense of when you do set the goals and when you don't when you do let yourself sit for that five and a half hours it's fascinating to me the challenge of sitting in uncertainty um, or feeling ambiguously about what you're about to do uh, sometimes sitting with fear or anxiety um, and sometimes not knowing what you're sitting with. Creativity often demands that of us, often. And that's never talked about in all the advice columns about how to be more creative. No one ever talks about that stuff, uh, but it happens. So that, that's where I'm really interested in hearing people talk about their, their experience and hearing people talk through the challenge of, do I give myself permission? To sit for five and a half hours sit for a while and, and find that impulse and let it come to me um, that I, I find absolutely fascinating uh, yeah so thank you thank you for sharing a, a, a big part of creativity is is contemplation mm, allowing yes. yourself the time and space and um, yes. Stuart I would say don't don't measure it in five and a half hours because it could have been five minutes, the last five minutes before you picked up the pencil, or it could have been the last five and a half years that you had that drawing in you. It could have been the last 10 years that you had that drawing in you. And it was just at that moment that it came out. That's so. beautifully, beautifully put, Simon, really beautifully put. Um, and I love your point that it is about contemplation and it is uh I think we struggle with all kinds of toxic ideas and myths about what creativity looks like and how it should be performed. And again, something that is never talked about and is not recognised as part of creative effort or work, for want of a better word, is that time spent in contemplation. People will sit, look at somebody contemplating and say they're not doing anything. Actually, they're doing something incredibly important. Um, absolutely. Yeah. I have another question, if, if I may. Um, is um, Substack a means to the end or the end? Um, and and I'll, I'll clarify that. Um, I do a bit of writing and there's a lot of tools out there. Look, I'm doing some writing now on just standard MS Word, but there's other tools such as Scrivener and um, I do screenplays as well, which you now there's some dedicated screenplay software um do you write directly into substack back end and then you just hit the publish button or do you um create in another form uh either in a in a journal longhand and then type it and edit it and refine it um so is substack a means to the end or the end for you for me, it's, um, I never, uh, not just Substack, no platform do I ever write directly into, ever. <laughs> and it comes from my history uh, a billion years ago when I first, was first blogging um, and using really chitty internet connections in the State Library. 
and I'd write something directly into the blogging platform I was using at the time and the internet, something would go wrong and I'd lose it all. So I got in the habit of um, always, I, I do keep notebooks where I jot down ideas. Um, and I, my process personally is that I, I harvest ideas always, writing them down in my little notebook or um, dotting them straight into Word um, or uh, I take screenshots of stuff I find on, on Twitter. I grab it wherever I can. I tend to write my, um, my prompts up in Word and then I cut and paste into Substack. So that's how I do it. I don't know how other people do it. And I don't know that Substack's a great tool for word processing. Uh, I don't think it functions like Scrivener, for example. Um, yeah. And for me, it's, it's not an end in any sense of the word. It's, it's a tool. I, I like using it. It's mm -hmm. not, I'm not technologically brilliant. So it's an easy tool for me to use, which is telling. Um, and it works for now, uh, and I'll, I'll keep on using it because I've got quite a few subscribers now, which is great, a few hundred. Um, but I, I'm not trying to be a great substacker. I'm trying to deliver uh, meaningful services around creativity. If that answers your question. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that you have subscribers does that, and I guess that puts some sort of expectation. For you to create content mm -hmm. um does that stifle or enhance your creative flow that's a great question actually because for me um the way i approached doing substack and and doing the advent calendar uh and then now doing a, a few substacks a month uh one technical thing i like about substack is you can queue up posts and schedule them ahead of time which is great um, but uh, like I said before, the other stuff I was doing, mentoring, workshopping and, and writing the longer form stuff is really intense. With Substack, I can, when I'm tired myself um, or a bit distracted when life is a bit busy with admin or marketing or whatever, it's easy for me to put the Substacks together. So um, I, I went for Substack and the, the shorter posts because I knew they were good for my clients or potential clients, those subscribers, but it was also good for my creative process and it fit in to my creative process really nicely. So I'm finding it quite, um, quite sustainable in, in terms of churning out uh, uh, content. I am bound to it. I've promised my subscribers they will get a newsletter on the last day of the month and the paid subscribers get another newsletter every fortnight. So I'm bound to that but I haven't had a problem um, meeting those deadlines at all because I can write the sub stacks when I'm in the mood and queue them up. That's been good. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, I'm going to stick the link to my blog where I just wrote down those quotes in case you wanted to um, refer to them in case there was anything you absolutely loved. And I also tried to make a, a quick summary of my main talking points as well. Um, I'm challenging myself at the moment not to rely on PowerPoint to make presentations. So I thought because I've denied you looking at text. I thought I'd put it in the blog and you can go and have a look. And I'll put it, also put it up on the KMLF page as well in the comments. Um, Arthur. Uh, yes, Th thanks, Meredith. Um, I'm interested, um, you, you mentioned my creative process and I'm sure, you know, each and every one is, is different, you know, she goes traveling and does wonderful pieces of art from his travels or he sees an amazing picture. You know, um, I, I personally find I'm far more creative when I'm interacting with other people and responding to the questions they ask or they're, they're sort of throwing something over the fence that, you know, comes in and go, oh, you know, I never really thought about that. With your own creative process, um, does it tend to come from within from... 
uh, uh, or does it tend to be stimulated by outside things? And where, are those things people or objects? That's a, a great question. Um, I think it's a mixture of both for me. I'm an introvert by nature, so I'm always going to want lots of time by myself. And I think I do my best ideating by myself. I'm an introvert who cares very much about people, and I find people and our society we live in very fascinating. So I know I'm also, I, I forage. I think of myself as a forager. I'm always out there grabbing stuff from wherever. I love tuning into conferences and, and um, things like that as well. So often when I'm interacting with people, what will happen is I'll have a light bulb moment, which is why I take my notebook everywhere with me. Um, or, or if I'm listening to something, um, uh, you know, I'll be jotting down notes. So I'll have a light bulb moment. I won't know what it means. I'll just you know, take a note. And then I go by myself because as an introvert, I need that alone time. And that's where I read and I either think, what the hell was I thinking and throw it out? Or I read it again and that's when I have the light bulb moment and the actual idea comes. I, I'm, again, really fascinated by this, um, by the, the difference between how introverts and extroverts uh, are creative. I don't think any one personality type is more or less creative. We've just got our different ways of doing it and into it. And um, it's not even really sensible to generalise too much about extroverts. Um, but I, again, I, I find I do a lot of work with people reassuring them, especially in the mentoring, more private sessions, uh, about because people worry that they're somehow wrong and they're, they're not um, right. I, I get a lot of introverts who've been in badly facilitated brainstorming sessions where they've been shouted over and um, they feel invisible. I've, I've had people cry and say, what's wrong with me? And I have to say nothing. And that says nothing about your creativity at all. That's a social dynamic you're responding to. So it's very interesting for me to talk to people about their, um, their personality types and emphasise that we're all abundantly creative, but we're all abundantly creative in our own individual way. And you just have to, uh, to use Simon's word, contemplate. For me, creativity is a lot about self-awareness and um, have self-awareness of the conditions that are right for you have self-awareness about a range of creativity skills that you will have and when you can use them. So as an introvert, I often don't ideate very well in groups, but as an introvert, I'm a watcher and I'm a listener and I tune into dynamics because that's my survival skill. And over the years, I've learned how to make that a strength. So I often work in, as a facilitator in groups. I often um, work with social dynamics. I um, hear other people's ideas, I draw people out, I include the shy people. So that's a skill set I bring as sort of social skills to creating in groups and that has value. And other people who love creating in groups, they're the ones riffing and having the light bulb moments and I'm facilitating, you know. So it's, it's helping people gain that self-awareness um, about the conditions that are right for them, but also the, their various strengths and how they can use them. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And, mm. you know, the, the whole thing about facilitation, you know, unfortunately, many facilitators think it's about them. You know, oh, I'm a great facilitator. Well, actually, it's about the way that you engage the others to, you know, meld with each other. It's a bit like kneading bread, right? If the bread, if the flour and water just sits there, it, it ferments and nothing happens. But if it's needed in the right way and you put the work into it, uh, you know, then the bread actually, you know, sort of uh, rises appropriately. Yes. Funny thing you say about the, uh, um, about the notebook. Uh, I used to have some of my best thoughts in the middle of the night and I'd wake up and turn the light on and I had the notebook and the pen beside my bed. But of course, you know, you turn the light on in the middle of the night, you get thumped from the, the other side of the bed, appropriately so. <laughs> uh, um, and and uh, so then I learned to write in the dark 
So I would wake up and I'd pick up the pen and paper and I would write. Uh, and one night I wrote a whole A4 page of stuff. Uh, and when I woke up in the morning, uh, I found that the pen had no ink in it. Oh, no. <laughs> so oh, no. These things happen. You know, you've got to capture it in the moment, right? That, that little moment of creativity, you've got to capture it because, you know, sometimes you, you think, oh, I'm gonna, I'll do that when I get home. And yeah. when you get home, you go, now, what was that? What was that I was going oh, to do? And, and it's just gone. It's, it evaporates somewhere. You know, it's hard to recapture. Fluorescent also, ink, that's what you need. Fluorescent in the dark ink. ink. <laughs> and also the act of writing something down or sketching it or whatever actually gets the wheels thinking even further too. You know, you, you, um, it helps you process as well as uh, remember what you're doing and as well as record what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. I, I have a notebook by my bed as well. Yeah. Um, I'm like I'm like Arthur. I, my ideas do disintegrate, but that's mainly because I have them in the shower and the water gets into the paper and makes it all soggy. <laughs> Try writing on the wall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, what I need is to, I need to be able to record it because I literally do mm. have my best ideas in the shower. Yeah. Um, I struggled for two weeks to get a, an idea for a, a workshop we did um uh at work and i just couldn't i couldn't come up with a thing i was totally dead and then the morning before i think you know the emergency last minute panic always helps creativity um i had this idea of running a game so by the time i got out of the shower i created the whole game in my head by the time i'd driven to work i decided do i make this in paper and print out a bunch of cards or do i write an app so I decided to write an app. And so by 3 a.m. the next morning, I'd finished the app and we ran it at 11 a.m. the next morning at the workshop down in Balan. And it worked fantastic. And I've done it again since using the game. So the beauty of doing it as an app is I could run it multiple times now to teach people about continuous improvement and what that might look like. And um, I, I don't know, if, you know, how do I turn that creativity on when I... When it's not required, eleven o'clock the next morning. That's that's what I need to learn. I need the the secret juice to switch that flick that switch in my head. Well, let us all know. <laughs> Sorry, Sharon. You need to get yourself a dive slate, Stuart. Then, if you think of something in the shower, yes, <laughs> it's waterproof and you can write on it. And won't disintegrate. That's, that's brilliant. Dive slate. You've given me the two magic words. That's awesome. I'm googling it now. That that's the thing about creativity, though. You can't. It's, it's not like a, people talk about it as if it's a little pat method or process that you can learn, like learning how to use a form of software and then switch on and off, and you can't. Um, I mean, there are a range of creativity skills. There are a range of hacks that some people find are great for, you know, um, in, inspiring sports and, and getting the work done. But most of all, it's, it's a mindset and... What, what artists have done, have had the privilege of developing is a mindset that looks at the world in a certain way and picks up on stimulus constantly in a certain way and then uses it. Um, we're all creative. It's just that some of us have had the chance to develop a creative mindset. Uh, another thing about Substack, and I forget what, one of you said that somebody, uh, Arthur or, or Stu just said then, made me realise one thing I like about Substack is having, is I, I now have a little library of all those little prompts that I can send people back to and they can easily riff through. And that, that's a nice feeling somehow. The other interesting thing for me, somebody asked me earlier about Substack and my creative process. What it has done is make me reassess myself as a, as a curator of knowledge and a curator of um, content, which I never looked on myself as before, but as well as my own original content that I put on Substack, I um, borrow stuff, stuff that's in the pub public domain, um, and share that and um, there's a lot of free stuff out there that people are happy for you to pass on and share especially in my free newsletter and there's a lot of stuff I adapt like I take little quotes or images and build exercises around them but it's um, it's an exercise in curation that creative organizing and framing and 
contextualizing of these little gems of, of knowledge and inspiration. And um, I've really enjoyed exploring that side of myself and developing that creative skill of curation and thinking about what curation is and what it means uh, to me. And um, yeah, that's been a good process. Just picking up on your um, uh, mindset, Meredith, is something that I had contemplated for some time. Uh, um, uh, the whole thing about mindset and, you know, sort of Carol Dweck's book about mindset, you know, sort of it, it's either sort of growth or fixed, right? Mm. Um, but actually, I think it's a spectrum. And, and you know, there's times when you're really quite set in, in what, uh, how something should be and other times mm -hmm. when perhaps you're quite open and more in a growth. And that's why I uh, wrote the term uh, mind flex rather than mindset. Set is concrete, right? Concrete sets. You know, how do we get something that is uh, a, a more open frame? I, mm. I have an opinion on something, but it's not set. You know, it's, it's, it's flexible because, you know, uh, Stuart or Sharon may say something that could then influence that uh, and it changes the frame of mind that I have around, you know, that particular context or, or perspective. So uh, uh, I really should put that up on uh, on uh, LinkedIn or yeah. wherever wherever it works. If any anything ever works anymore, which you know I, I, I doubt, but uh, um, it's it's just a I think a word that's that's really quite useful to change the language a little bit to you know get us out of that that idea of something is set, you know, because in, 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 I write about it in becoming adaptable, but, but uh, it, it's in the modern world, you know, and you asked the question back to the beginning, you know, sort of how is it different to before, you know, things were a lot more stable and things were a lot, you know, uh, um, people were more patterned, I think, uh, or they could afford to be more patterned. You know, you had a, a, a well laid out career path, for example, but uh, now I think that uh, uh, um, we've really got to have a very open mind on everything, even things that we know change really quite quickly. I, so, I think, yeah, I, I think that's a great point and that, that idea of mind flex instead of mindset, I think that's a lovely, lovely point to make. And, and uh, a main, it's, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a nice loop. I think about the creativity all the time that you need to be resilient to make creative work but even trying to make creative work makes you more resilient mm -hmm. and this is another loop you know where you need to have that open mind you need to have that ability to sit with the stuff you don't know or you're not sure about or you haven't um, fully processed yet in order to be creative but even trying to be creative makes you like that and, um, yeah, I think mind flex is a nice way of, of being because when I think about the artist's mind, it's, it's really talking about a way of being in the world mm. yeah. rather than no. having a fixed position and responding to the world. Yeah. Yeah. When, when I described mind flex, I talked about um, parallel processing of, of multiple aspects of what's happening. So, mm. you know, the, the, the anticipation, the inspiration, the, you know, uh, the creation, the... the uh, um, the, the the innovation comes from that, you know. But if 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 you have one frame of mind as you're facilitating uh, uh, the conversation with others or with yourself, if it's a self-reflective process, then you're far less likely to to give something a a, a broader, more robust uh, output or outcome out out of the cycle. Yes. Agreed. And as Stuart mentioned before that, I, you know, that I ask some open questions and that's what I really try and do. Um, one of my little pamphlets on my website is called The Right Question. And it's just a bloody great long list of questions that I, I tend to ask um, my mentees. But I just keep reminding myself as a mentor and as a facilitator, it's not my job to tell or teach uh, because I don't know. And it, uh, like I said earlier, I love asking or giving these prompts to people because they have such a diversity of answer and things I could never have imagined in my life. So it's a reminder that I don't know. But what I am good at is listening, bearing witness, offering companionship, 
um, being a thinking partner, if you like, and uh, asking the right question. I keep reminding myself that it's, that's my job, to open up a space for com uh, contemplation, again, that word, and speculation, exploring self-awareness, um, but it's not for me to know. That, that was an interesting conversation just between Arthur and yourself then. And for me, the whole concept of mindset is has evolved and taken on a new meaning. And I guess maybe it's because the work I do and I always challenge people around the concept of mindset and the word set has, well, for my knowledge, three different meanings. You know, it can be set as in fixed and it can be set as in a series. You have a, a set of playing cards or a set of um, plates, but also set is getting ready for something. You know, you reflect back on your school sports days when the, when the person with the start gun would say, ready, set, go. So it's the, the stage between getting ready and the, the stage before launching into something. So you're getting set for something. So I always mm -hmm. challenge people around your mindset is not a fixed way of thinking, but it's around getting ready to think expansively for new possibilities and new options. And that encapsulates for me the whole fundamentals of creativity and the mm. fact of contemplation that you engage in in that and another part of creativity is is that this um um uh persistence you actually mm. you change you challenge yourself you are set for that new way of thinking as opposed to set being fixed so it's just a bit of a, a different way i like to think and challenge people in in the work i do nice one nice one that made me think simon that i often think about um, the word potential, uh, that what I'm trying to do is, especially in that challenge of creating in fragments when I'm dealing with busy, busy people, and it's not can you write a novel this year because, no, you're not going to write a novel, but can you engage in some creative work or thinking or even take that rest but be mindful that you're doing it um, to help yourself be more creative uh, but it's all about really engaging with that side of yourself so you you remain in touch with your potential to be creative. And I, I think that links in with what you were just saying, that that way of setting yourself up and really set go. But, um, yeah, see what you can do. I'm, I'm just keen to uh, hear briefly, um, and maybe we'll, we'll have a conversation offline, another forum or whatever, is around the, the mentoring you do for mm -hmm. creative. Um, is that people that are wanting to be creatives or is that creatives that have a blockage or some sort of um, uh, stifling going on in some capacity? It's, it's an interesting one. It, it has so far been people wanting to be more creative. Um, uh, like I said, knowledge workers uh, who have a, a strong sense that creativity is important. They have a value for it. Um, uh, but they, they're frustrated because they don't see how to develop that side of themselves. And often their blockage is around the fact they're so damned busy. So they're trying to get a sense of orientation within their own heads of as they're, they're kind of on, on this un onslaught of demands from the outer world and people wanting them to do stuff, needing them to do stuff, um, how can they find a, a place of orientation where they can get that sense of what it means to be creative? So that mentee I mentioned earlier she, where she said, I don't even know how to get started, she was one of those people wanting to be creative but thinking well what does that even mean so it's um i find it very poignant actually there's a sense of yearning um but a, a sense of disorientation like a, a they've been split off from a part of their inner lives that they know exists and that they have a value for um so i feel very inspired this year I've been interested to see that people who work creatively, like uh, people like designers or writers, um, and there's the theatre coach, for example, 
coming into my workshops. Um, and that, that's very interesting. They're, they're just, they don't feel stifled. They're just really interested to talk about creativity and they're looking for um, new ideas um, and, and ways to reflect on their practice as, a, as just a part of their ongoing practice. Um, my background in the arts industry, it, arts people talk endlessly about being artists or about working in the arts endlessly, but it's it's part of our creative practice. So that's what they do. Yeah. And I'm happy to ask another one. If, uh, I don't want to don't jump in, but um, I'm keen to know what for you creativity actually is um is it the focus on producing some artistic piece whether it's written or that beautiful painting behind you or a, a piece of sculpture or something is it something a creation like that that can be then consumed either immediately or into perpetuity or is it something else and 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 for me, I think anyone can be creative and it's in the eye of the the person that's creative. Like who's to say if you go to the market and the most creative person is actually the fishmonger, mm. the person with a creatively presented row of products. Is that creativity in your mind? Because it certainly is in, in mine. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I, um, I think we're all creative and I think it manifests in different ways for different people. Um, I'm deliberately cagey about talking about what creativity is because I, I like people to tell me if they reckon they're creative or they want to be creative, that's great. Um, I guess I'm on the lookout for self-limiting talk that, um, you know, I don't make up, therefore I'm not creative. I don't, I don't agree with that. So for me, creativity, we were talking earlier about that way of being in the world. That's for me what creativity is, um, linking into that, uh, linking into the imagination um, and through that being in the world in a certain way and experiencing it in a certain way. Sometimes that does lead to outcomes. Thank you. That's my grandmother's painting, by the way, and she was a big inspiration to me as a, as a kid because um, she was a, a very, um, very creative woman. But um, sometimes it leads to outcomes, and I'm very happy to talk to people who are working towards outcomes, if they're writing something or trying to produce something. Um, I used to work as an arts manager, so I'm well used to talking to people making art and talking them through that stage, how to project manage that. Love having that conversation, but it's not the only conversation we should have. And if people are hung up saying, uh, I, I'm blocked and I haven't created anything recently, therefore I'm not creative anymore, no, nah. no. Nah. I, I want to I wanna talk them down past that and say you can't not be creative. So if you feel blocked, this is about your relationship with your creative self, not a lack of creativity. But, yeah, basically I agree with you, Simon. Anybody else have any questions or statements? Thank you for the questions so far. I found them really, really interesting. And yes, I'm happy to continue the conversation offline, either through the social medias, which are at the top of the Zoom chat, or uh, go to my website and send me a message and we can fix up a Zoom time to have a yak. I can talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> yep. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, Meredith, for, well, not talking all day, but <laughs> engaging everybody in very interesting discussions and questions and thoughts. My pleasure. Uh, now, I checked and there doesn't seem to be any confirmation for what next month's topic is other than hopefully something related to Indigenous knowledge or Reconciliation Week. So um, 
Yeah, keep an eye out on this space, uh, on your emails that we're putting things together now and um, just been a bit of a um, uh, busyness with the facilitators and we're sorting that out as we speak. Um, but it is a busy week, a busy month for KM. We have a few things coming up on the international sp uh, stage. The uh, KMGN, uh, the Knowledge Management Global Network, is running their um, Hackamathon this, this month. And um, being in Australia, we get to sort of be the first ones to kick it off. And we would absolutely love it if, um, uh, if you would think about coming along and representing KMLF on the, on the global stage. There is a several, series of challenges, been a lot of work putting into preparing for the uh, Hackamathon. Um, and we're looking at, at what KM looks like for the next 20 years. So what sort of um, uh, problems are gonna be arising, what sort of solutions might work for them and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, can KM be monetized and those sorts of questions. So uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And because we're sort of first on the, you know, the world time scale, we get to be the first ones off the deck uh, to start playing with those challenges and laying the groundwork for the people following us. We'll be using an online Miro environment and people are meeting up physically around the world. I'm not sure we've got um, enough, you know, people in one place to do that here. We were talking with uh, one of the leaders from Israel, just trying to explain how big Australia is. You don't just jump in a car and drive down to Jerusalem. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it's a bit bigger than that. So we'll probably run it mainly online, but keep an eye out for it. I've just put a link in the uh, chat there for um, to register for it. And we'd love to have you come along uh, as KM members and we might um, send a bit of a message out to everyone else as well. Um, it's also a good chance to build some of those relationships with other KMers around the world get a feel for um, <clears throat> uh, the newer faces on the block. Uh, I got to meet a great guy from uh, Vlad from uh, the Netherlands the other day, who's running a business over there in KM. And uh, there's some really great people in the field now, and you've got to sort of proactively network. And this is one of those chances to do that with, um, with some of your fellow KMers. So I encourage you to sign up and come along. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I will stop the recording now.